much, Maren, and um, I hope everyone's had such a fantastic day. I know I have. It's been really wonderful to be here at OER22, and I do hope if you're joining us online as well, you're enjoying um, the conference. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to um, be chairing this next session. I'm going to invite um, my uh, panellists to come up now as well. So we've got um, Gary, Jane, Dara and Lorna. So please come up and we'll um, start the session. In the so just to give a little bit of background why everyone's getting comfortable about today's session. Um, as we know, um, during the pandemic, there was an increase in e-books um, as students kind of moved to studying away from campus kind of simultaneously as that kind of progressed through the pandemic, we also had a price rise, both here in the UK and elsewhere in the world, in terms of accessing materials. As you're probably aware, um, open uh, textbook <coughs> costs um, and textbook campaigns, particularly in areas of the world such as North America, have been a really key kind of way in which OER has been mainstreamed. And here in the UK, during the pandemic, we've had um, well, we do have campaigns such as ebook SOS who are challenging publishers and bringing the issue to wider attention. Um, so, for example, you may have seen there's um, an article by Anthony Sinnott that came out recently talking about the Publishers Association report 2021 that talks about the increase in profits 14% um, during, during that year. So, We've also kind of done some work about open textbooks in the UK. Um, myself and colleagues worked on a project um, called UK Open Textbooks a few years ago, um, where although in the educators that we um, were kind of working with as part of that project, um, people, there was a low awareness of OER. Actually, people were really enthusiastic when we got talking with people about open educational resources and about open textbooks. So for this panel, what we wanted to do is kind of explore really, some of the um, open responses to these kind of issues and discuss the role of open textbooks. So just to give you an idea of like, kind of put one group of people here um, to help explore that issue. So I'm now gonna ask um, each panel um, member to say, introduce themselves and just say a few words and about that, what their role is in relation to open textbooks. So um, Lorna, would you like to start? Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks for inviting me along today. Um, so my name is Lauren Campbell and I'm an Education Technology Team Manager at the University of Edinburgh where I manage the University's Open Education Resources Service and I'm also a trustee of Alt and Wikimedia UK. So in terms of open textbooks, although um, Edinburgh has been supporting the creation of open education resources of all different kinds for um, five or six years now, Open textbooks was not an area that we were particularly active in until um, uh, last year when my senior colleague, Melissa Hampton, who many of you will be familiar with, um, suggested that it might be interesting to try and repurpose some of our existing open education resources to create an open textbook. Um, so, so that's what we did. We applied a very small grant, a tiny little student experience grant, and we took some content that was originally created for a MOOC that had already been repurposed for an open campus course and repurposed it again to create an open textbook. So that was really our first foray into um, the creation of open textbooks, but it's something that we're certainly um, very interested in seeing in the world. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hi there, so um, I'm... Is it working? Is it working? Is it working? Hi there. So, hi there. I'm uh, Gary, hello to everybody. So, I'm the director of the library and library services at the Open University. Um, so, I guess for, for, for me, Beck, the OU is slightly different, obviously, uh, given that it's, a, it's an online delivery uh, in that sense. But we have a, an awful long history. We have a, not an awful long history, but we have a long history uh, in relation to open learn and so forth. And we, we obviously provide some of those resources as open textbooks, they're not published in that sense, but they're available uh, in that sense. And we have an awful good practice, so I'll stop saying that, we have a really great, we have a really great practice in terms of our, our rights team within, within the university who are always looking at open educational resources to use within our courses. Um, and that's something that we, we consciously do, um, but that's probably part and parcel of the fact that the way in which we deliver and write our courses is maybe obviously slightly different in terms of the scaffolding and the support that's around our, our courses because of the open access um, option that the university provides. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
we also had probably one of the most high profile um, projects that happened right at the beginning of the pandemic um, last April was the, um, the team behind the Masters in Critical Care. All these resources directly addressed with um, are addressed the needs of healthcare workers who were moving back into critical care as a result of COVID. So they made all these resources freely and openly available with support for future learning actually. So that was a really sort of high profile initiative to just get resources out to people who needed them. Um, we also had you know things like we had technicians all over the university who were 3D printing face visors and things like that. And we put the, the models up on Sketchfab so they could be downloaded and reused by other people. And perhaps the other um, pertinent example was um, we all read out an OER policy and our lecture recording policy, which were available under open license. We also, at the start of the pandemic, created a new um, uh, virtual classroom policy to address with um, the recording of virtual classroom sessions, and we also made that freely available as well under open license because we knew that there was a lot of other institutions grappling with the, the online pivot and getting in, or you know, putting all the teaching online, whereas before our virtual classroom service was a really small service um, that didn't have a specific policy of its own, but suddenly with all the teaching and learning pivoting to be online. Um, we needed a policy to, to address some of the copyright um, data protection concerns. Thank you. Um, it, it was a, a bit more of a steeper pivot for, for UCL, specifically talking about textbooks. Um, prior to 2020, um, UCL library services were still predominantly buying print editions of textbooks that were required or essential for a lot of our modules. Um, some departments and disciplines were doing things slightly differently, but um, predominantly we were still we were still purchasing the print copies and they would be for students who, who didn't want to purchase or couldn't purchase their own copies. Um, so when the pandemic hit, um, we did have to um, pivot that and, and sort of change our model um, and, and find e-alternatives. Um, that proved challenging, um, meant that we had to grapple with a lot of different e-textbook aggregators to get the content that we, that we needed to deliver our courses. Um, and, and meant that we needed to request more funding for that. So um, uh, the budget for uh, purchasing of e-textbooks was relatively small and, and, and had to pivot to, to almost three million um, to be able to facilitate all of that essential content that, that um, we had been used to buying in, in print um, with a lot of our students not being able to access it. Um, so the reaction to that at UCL was very much, you know, it was still quite a shock to, to, to pivot in that way um, and it made us think a bit more carefully about, you know, whether that is a, um, that is a system we want to sort of be tethered to um, and was very much the impetus for us thinking about open education resources, specifically open textbooks. Um, UCL has a, a wonderful history of open access, mostly in, in research, um, uh, with the kind of education element being a little bit slower to develop, a little bit lower on the priority list, and that's really changed since since 2020. And um, you know, my role and the program itself is, is a new um, a new area that they're, they're funding. So um, we did have some. Um, some elements of, of OER that already existed. Um, we have an OER repository that was um, developed mostly as sort of a proof of concept, so it's not fully fully developed, but it's, it's up there. Um, we have a landing page with a list of resources for uh, academics who want to find OER uh, and create OER, um, but that was something that we sort of that we had created but not necessarily put a huge amount of resources into that, that we're pivoting into um, prioritising. Fantastic. And Gary, I've got a view of the So I think it's quite, it's quite interesting hearing the, the different sources. So, so as you can imagine, the OU, we don't, we don't use a lot of, of, of textbooks actually generally in our courses because obviously the courses that we're producing are, are in a sense textbooks within themselves that have obviously fully integrated all our library resources etc completely embedded within the courses um, and therefore the impact was, was was less on us and I think it provided us with an opportunity or enabled us to provide support into the sector in the way in which it's been done in terms of supporting the sector 
being able to make the pivot, I guess, on, online. So, um, you know, within the library services, for example, we, we ran a session about how to deliver uh, perhaps live uh, digital literacy skills engagement uh, with, within that. We had over a thousand, four, four different continents. We had a thousand librarians tuning into that, into that session where we're sort of supporting the sector. And, and I guess we can't, open and learn in itself, we can't, you know, it went from something like about nine million users or separate accounts to, to peaking at about 14 million in the second year of the, uh, the, the pandemic and past its hundredth millionth learner in, in, in that time. Um, and obviously we're providing an awful lot there, particularly within the different nations, um, around skills development, literacy development, um, but some of the things that sort of played out through that was, was obviously elements associated with digital property. It's all very well having all the materials there available online and, and available, but then, then we've got to sort of raised other, other kind of concerns. So it's been quite a, quite a different sort of journey for the early year in, in terms of its role and how it's supported the sector through, through the use of you know, different sorts of technologies and, and getting online. So. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, um, I think we've probably touched a little bit on this actually as we've kind of worked um, through um, um, and heard a bit more about what's been happening at each, each institution. But I wonder what kind of changes you've been seeing um, in terms of educational materials during the pandemic. So, you know, did they become more expensive? I know Gary just mentioned that Open University you know, that's maybe less of, a, of, of, of an issue. And I just wonder what the university's responses were to that. I know you've touched on aspects of that, but whether there was anything else that well, I think one of, one of the things I just wanted to pick up was, um, so in March 2020, um, I, I was conscious that everyone had shifted online and there might well be lots of questions about well, how's that going to work from a copyright perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd written a book with Chris Morrison that's called Copyright Online, Copyright and E-Learning, and we thought, well, let's see if we can actually just get that made open, act openly available as a, an open textbook, and approach our publisher, who um, is, is Facet, who is a, a lot of the library association publisher, but they said, unfortunately, no, you can't just flip that book um, open, that they would let us make three chapters available, and this is kind of where Alt stepped in and Mara and, and Martin said, well, you know, we can support you to run a webinar because we, we thought, well, let's, let's talk to the sector and tell them the stuff that's in the book. If we can't actually just make the book available, we'll bring the community together. So since then we've run 50 webinars where we have had so many, mainly librarians come in and we could see, you know, a real crisis point where the British Library was shut. Many libraries could not get the books that they needed to students. They couldn't buy them in digital format. They couldn't get hold of them in print format if they wanted to scan them. There was a lot of publishers who, to start with, made a lot of resources available for free on a temporary basis and the copyright licensing agency extended their license to let you scan two chapters but all of that finished by july of 2020 it was like pandemic's over you know you've got to get hold of these so i would say the sector was really struggling with trying to get access to content and starting to realize that a lot of the content that it thinks it owns it doesn't and you know I think that's what started real conversations about firstly being much more confident about saying we can use copyright exceptions to make material available for teaching but also a bigger conversation with our authors who are our academics to say actually is there not a better way we could do this you know if you want to write a book and you want it to be available for your students to read then maybe we start thinking about things working in a slightly different way, which is where I think, you know, we're, why we're having the, the discussions about open textbooks now. Yeah, interesting. I can see that. Yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, follow, follow up. Well. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, and and that, that has been how Helen Steele has, has, um, has felt also, that, that very much that, uh, and Paul Ayers, our um, pro-based provost of library services, has spoken a lot about this. 
um, with um, Johanna Anderson, the, um, the lead uh, for the hashtag ebooks e SOS campaign. Um, but there was very little regulation of, of how publishers, commercial publishers, were pricing um, the e-text version of, of, of the, you know, a PDF version of a, of a print book that we would, we would normally buy. Um, and that, that could change at any time. Um, so, you know, really difficult to, to assess whether budgets could accommodate certain textbooks that, that teaching faculty needed to deliver their courses. Um, and uh, yeah, really made us rethink that reliance on, on commercial publishing. Um, and what we decided at UCL is to use the infrastructure that we already had within UCL Press as a, as a publishing output, as a household publishing output, to also include the idea that we might want to publish our own open access textbooks. Um, so all of our books at the moment are open access, and we have all of that kind of. Um, all of those routes to market, all of that kind of infrastructure to create kind of um, uh, uh, books, um, and that we would just we would think about how we could use that to create some of our own. Um, that brings up a lot of different challenges. Writing textbooks are very different to writing research-based uh, books, and with um, teaching faculty already kind of really really overloaded with, with teaching commitments, you know, how do we how do we encourage our academics to also be open access textbook authors? And what we realised quite quickly is that a lot of our academics were already producing different kinds of resources to help them either pivot to the online teaching or engage with their students in a different way. So they, they already had sort of the starting points of, um, of what we would consider you know, a, a, a homegrown textbook that they could use for their course. Um, so kind of using you know, using what our academics were already creating and helping them develop that into a you know, fully, fully open access textbook. Um, so really the, the, the pandemic had been a huge catalyst for change for us and how we thought about that. Um, and, uh, okay. okay. Um, I mean, I certainly identify with what, uh, what's already been said and um, certainly within Edinburgh, um, Within the OER service, we did roll out more um, digital skills workshops about copyright literacy, specifically for hybrid and online teaching and learning, so we fill that gap. At the same time, in the library, different bit of information services, um, the, the university library have actually just set up uh, an open press, it's called Edinburgh Diamond, and this builds on the previous open journal service that the library supported, which was a very successful um, open journal service which was primarily provided for students to co-create their own open journals and they produce some fabulous stuff. So they've now expanded that service um, to include e-books and it's a very, very new service and the first e-book we have is, is the um, Fundamentals of Music Theory uh, textbook that the little project created. But I think um, the point that Dara made about um, a lot of academics are already creating content that looks quite similar to open textbooks. So we already have a couple of open textbook type things on our OER service website, which were created completely independently by academics using the top pages. And that's where they put their, they were effectively course handbooks, which they turned into GitHub pages books. Um, and the fundamentals of music theory textbook, the content that went into that, like I said, some of it was originally created for our MOOC, but a lot of the text content was effectively a course handbook. So I think there is a lot of mileage in repurposing existing content that our academics are really creating. I guess I'd, I'd sort of add, or the sort of extension to that really is, that obviously not with, notwithstanding the only slightly different model, but I'd be really interested to sort of explore the conversation around, you know, how is that changing our pedagogy. How is that changing the way in which it's, it's already existing in terms of handbooks, but how is the use of OER starting to change the pedagogical structures, the way in which we're teaching, or, or perhaps uh, communities in other institutions are, are teaching? Because obviously at the OU it's, it's very structured, we have a learning design structure and framework. In essence, the handbooks that you're talking about there are the things that we're actually producing, because they're co-created at the university, so it's not just the academic involved the librarians involved, the learning designers are involved, the media, um, the media um, assistants are involved in terms of the design of the interactive elements associated with that. So that's a, a really interesting piece to kind of think about. 
the only other thing I'd sort of add to that, there seems to be much more collaboration in terms of, so within the library sector, you know, we have different communities, whether there will be national communities, SCIRL and in Scotland or, or Wealth down in Wales. There's much more, I think, collaboration kind of happening across those groups in sharing and understanding an open press within SCIRL that we are part of at the, at the OU, but starting to think about how we collaborate more within the sector, which I think is a consequence, actually. Thanks so much, yeah. Thank you. And I think um, we've heard a little bit about, um, you know, in terms of the pandemic and at UCL, the, um, that kind of accelerated maybe the, the um, uh, influence over textbooks. You normally mention the textbook project at Edinburgh as well. I wondered um, what kind of role do you see for open responses um, to the kind of issues that we've been talking about so far? Um, and are there particular times which an open response would be more impactful? I think one of the most important things about open responses to crisis is it's about sustainability, I think, and I think that's one of the things, that's why we saw um, UNESCO putting out their, you know, in addition to the, uh, the recommendation of the We Are, they had the, the um, I forget the name of it, they had the, the white paper, it was a, they had a, a secondary document that basically supported the use of open education resources to address the disruption of education resulting from the pandemic and that the, the, the quickest and the cheapest and easiest way and the most effective way to do this is by you know, providing more access to open education resources and I do think that's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that the best way to make education uh, open and sustainable and accessible is is through making our education resources more open. I want to make a different point actually, if I could, which uh, which was which was actually about um, we were, when we were talking about who we collaborate with. I wanted to make a point about students as well. Um, so I did a piece of research during the pandemic about. Um, students' academic reading preferences, um, building on some work that comes out of UCLA. Um, a woman at the library, Diane Mizraki, has done a lot of work on students reading online and reading in print. And we did a study um, which we're just in the process of analysing the data between US and UK students and their is quite a strong, from all of the work that she's done previously, students know what they don't like about ebooks and not reading online. And I, I feel that open textbooks is an opportunity to create something better than there might be around at the moment. There's a lot of you know students complain about if they've got to use the textbook, you know, and it's it's not in print because they want to take detailed notes. They want to be able to navigate around it, you know, and I think there's a lot of potential that many of the commercial ebook um, suppliers promised us that we've never really had, you know, that we could do that hopefully with with open textbooks, you know, make something better, but but kind of really understand what it is and when our students might actually want print as well, because. I know it doesn't, it's not a very popular argument. We've got rid of a lot of books on shelves and the pandemic suggested that online was, you know, the panacea and this was the great thing, but many students want to read a book in print when they're studying it and they're taking notes. So, thanks, Jane. Oh, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good point as well about um, the books needing to be in print and I know um, I, I'm currently enrolled in a language course at, at King's in the evening on a Monday and I want both the textbook <coughs> and my laptop and I want a physical copy so I can scroll down yeah. so I want both <laughs> and I think a lot of That's students yeah. feel like That's that too. <laughs> so we're having to think about how we, how we can facilitate that with an open textbook. Um, what does that mean? We can include what level of interactivity does that allow us if we want both both options? Um, uh, another thing that I've been thinking about 
as well in, in terms of the role of open textbooks is, and we're having a lot of these discussions at UCL, is, is whether the tr a traditional textbook model works for everyone. And what we're finding is it doesn't necessarily, um, and that there are some disciplines where a, a, a more alternative um, way of curating educational content is, is much better. Um, be that video content, audio content, different kinds of non-textual content. Um, and how, you know, how do we think of that as a textbook, as an open textbook? Um, what would that look like in our program? Um, so we're having to think very carefully about, you know, we want the program to respond and to be um, used for a lot of different disciplines and um, areas, and so we'll have to think about each textbook differently, which is, again, very different from a commercial publisher, and, um, and taking that, you know, I'm coming from that commercial publishing background into now a completely open access environment, and what we're thinking about in terms of the criteria, what we need these textbooks to do is so different. Um, uh, and where we'll, where we'll see the impact, um, we're, not, we're not looking for it to sell or you know, in, that, in those commercial terms, thinking about you know, how much we might um, make on it and, and, and how much it would cost to produce. What we're thinking about is what impact it will make on teaching and learning locally, what impact it will make globally, um, you know, which courses um, we need to sort of focus on to create textbooks for is that because they're, um, the, the commercial divisions are, are very expensive and we think we can do better or where there is a gap in the commercial market so it's not um, you know it's not, a, it's not a very popular course around the world there's not enough of a market for commercial publishers to publish a textbook on it but if we produced something that that could make much more impact in that in that particular field um, in teaching and learning. So lots of different things we have to think about and, and opening up what an open access textbook can be um, versus a commercial textbook. Thanks. Just very briefly, just to add to, to those things, a couple of things for me that I, I, I expect to kind of extend. There's something around how accessible or how diverse you know, the materials and textbooks that we're, we're producing, which I think is really, you know, I wonder whether there's an opportunity to open up and make sure that everything is is becoming more accessible, more diverse in terms of its, its reach, in terms of the activity. I think the other thing that I wanted to kind of add was the connection really between, because uh, I think the opportunity is there now, between, we've talked a little bit today, I think, in some of the sessions, but you know, open research, open scholarship, and open models, and the connection there between open curriculum in relation to that, how those, how those are connected. Um, we've talked a little bit about linked data and other such things as well, but there's, there's real opportunity there, I think, to really kind of drive that connection and, and for that to be visible um, and, and connect and be able to kind of move both ways through that journey from, from curriculum back out from the, the scholarship activity into the research and vice versa. Um, so I think there's those sorts of opportunities I think, which, are, which have come out of, out of this pandemic and the situation we're in. Thanks so much, Gary. I know we were talking earlier before the session started talking about the public domain. This is an opportunity as well to connect um, communities as well, to connect different groups of um, academics, librarians, people that maybe, you know, different people with similar concerns and kind of bring people together to take action around, um, around um, these issues. So I'm conscious of time. I mean, it's been a fantastic um, talking with everyone. I've got one final question mm -hmm. that we're going to end on. It's a big one. So, um, what is your vision for um, uh, open education in UK HEI? It's a big question. So, in higher education, um, just to um, and how do we get there as well? So, I just wondered. If, um, big question. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Just to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Um, do you want to I think that is well, I think you're very cheeky there. You, you, you added the, and how do you get it? I, 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 really, I don't think I've got that in my mind. I think for me, the vision is, is about those open, open frameworks, open curriculum, and being able to kind of go and use and pick. And obviously, that's discipline specific. There will be different frameworks for different disciplines. And just making sure that that's available. I do think there's opportunities with AI, I have to say. Um, with with semi-automating open frameworks and open curriculum kind of development in terms of programs and structures 
for them for us to be able to use it. It's actually personalised, I have to say. It's kind of targeted to the individual student and being able to understand that and personalise that in an open way. But there's something about that connection and connecting open curriculum with research and scholarship in the way which I've said, but making that available and personalised in some sense. So much more community driven activity in, in some sense and therefore it's more around the scaffolding that you're putting around that, it's more around the, the frameworks and teaching that you have around it, that's, that's kind of what and I have no idea how you can get there, so, so <laughs> that's I'm not just ignoring that. that universities are there for, what, how the money comes into universities, how it goes out, where it's spent, and, and to start questioning whether that is, you know, how, the way things are working at the moment is, you know, it doesn't have to stay like that. There, there is, you know, universities are hugely important to the economy. We know that a lot of them are having to operate much more like a business, but that doesn't mean, you know, everything we do has to be to maximise profit and about, you know, we are, it's a community and it is about sharing and in many ways, yes, some universities are competing, but many are not competing. They're, you know, certainly within disciplines, scholars work together in this, you know, collegiate way and that's what we want to see. I suppose I think where we need, how we need to get there is to really, um, a lot of the work I've often done is with early career researchers and I think if we can get people when they're at the point of doing their, you know, finishing their PhD of understanding the benefits of open more broadly, you know, whether it's open access, open education, to ask big questions about who it, what is it that they're trying to do at that point in their career then we'll bring about change to, you know, on a, on a kind of, because I, I think it's really hard to Many people are at the vice chancellor level. That it's not going to, you're not going to change a lot of things. I think at that level now, it's, it feels, you know, we need to sort of start with the younger researchers coming through and show them that there's another way of doing this. And and I think COVID gives us a reason to say this is, you know, why we, we should be working together. Okay. Yeah, and just to pick up on Jean's points, I think perhaps the way that we really do. Um, embed openness across the sectors by thinking about how openness does actually support the business models of higher education on a, in a very pragmatic way. Um, but beyond that as well, I think we need to think you know, in, in, uh, in, in bigger terms about um, sustainability and particularly about the sustainable development goals and how you know, we are all part of this world and we're all trying to work together in this sort of 
um, project of education and also bringing in the sort of the ethical and the social justice issues. And I think the, uh, the ALTS um, ethical framework for learning technology is a really important step forward there. Um, so I think we do need to you know, think very pragmatically at the local level, but I think we need to really set our sights much further to the horizon. So we are thinking really about uh, knowledge equity and ethics and sustainability. Thanks so much, Fiona. Thanks, um, to everyone in the panel. I think that's um, yeah, it's been an interesting discussion. I think it's really kind of exciting. Looking forward as well in terms of the things that you mentioned about community kind of building that kind of multifaceted layered approach to things and creativity as well. So we needed to do that. Um, so I want to say a really big thank you um, to the panelists for um, a wonderful discussion and uh, sharing their thoughts. Thank you so much.